briefly, we talked about um, different funeral arrangements, memorial arrangements, anything that's popped into your head this week as you've gone out from that? Anything you've been contemplating? It was interesting, um, and I know she would say we could share this, talking to Mary Kay Hefty this week. I went over to her house for coffee and she had this really cool thing on the table. I said, oh, that's a beautiful, you know, piece. And it was a heart and it was made out of glass and it looked like a big paperweight. And I said, that is so cool. She said, that's Kurt. That's mm -hmm. Kurt. Mm -hmm. She had his ashes molded into um, this crystal uh -huh. heart. And she said, I talked to him a lot during the day. He's here with me. I thought that was really a cool, cool thought. Well, this week we're gonna focus on completing a legal document that not only talks about what we want our final affairs, our last wishes, our memorial to be maybe, but what we want our healthcare to be when we can talk about it, not in a crisis moment. Um, so let's open with prayer and we'll get started. Loving Father, we thank you for this safe place and safe community to gather and talk about challenging topics. Thank you for bringing Chris to lead us today. Help us not to fret to do our best to ease the way of those we love, but to know that you've got us covered. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we're fortunate to have Chris Green join us today. She's been with Nathan Grace a couple other times, so we're kind of her family too. Um, she's an advanced care planning coordinator and a certified planetologist, which means that's somebody that's dedicated to better understanding death, dying, Grieving, loss, and bereavement. So that'll kind of all be woven in a little, I suspect, too. So thank you. Yes, thank you. It's a real pleasure to be back here at Amazing Grace. It's such a warm and welcoming church. And I felt such a, such a nice, warm feeling just walking through the doors. It's wonderful. You're, you're very um, gracious to your guests. So I'm talking about advanced directives today and end of life planning. All righty. So we can go lots of different ways, but I usually like to start with a little bit of history. And actually, before I even start with that, I stand up and sit down um, just because it's comfortable for me. And so I sometimes do that. The second is a real accommodation. Um, I have almost complete hearing loss in my left ear and my tinnit, the disease that I have, I get tinnitus. And so it's really loud today. So that means for me to hear your questions and especially online, you may have to speak up or I may ask you to repeat. And that's just the way it is for me today, but that's, that's what it is. All right, thank you. So we're going to start with a little bit of history. Why do we want to talk about advanced directives? Because historically, there have been some legal cases. Way back in the 60s, if you remember Karen Ann Quinlan, that name? Yes. All right, that was the very first case. She was 21 years old, very young person. And her family, she became unconscious after she consumed Valium and was on a crash diet and she went into a coma. And this went on for quite a while. She became into a persistent vegetative state, which means basically you're lying in bed in like a coma, unable to move or recognize the world around you, right? So her family won a case in order to remove the ventilator. The vent a ventilator is a tube that you put down your throat to help you breathe, <laughs> all right, or force you to breathe, all righty? So that's ventilation. And we're going to talk more about those terms later as well. But in Karen Ann Quinlan's case was the first one that really set the stage for this discussion that family members or people around you who care and love you would want to speak for you on your behalf when you can't speak for yourself. Like you've got a breathing tube forcing you to breathe. 
So she won that case, her family won that case. They removed the ventilator. Then there was um, Nancy Krizan, and in the 80s, she um, was in a motor vehicle accident. And they concluded that um, in the rehab hospital, that she too was never going to become fully conscious. And this family fought for the right to remove the feeding tube. The feeding tube usually goes up through your nose and nurse, correct me <laughs> if I'm wrong, but it usually goes through the nose and down into your stomach. And it gives you the calories you need to stay alive. This family went to court and said, we want that removed because she'd never want to live like that. She's in a persistent state of unawareness and forced and feeding her in this method is not quality of life. They won that case. So it set the stage for refusing medical treatments regarding capacity. Capacity is another legal term. Capacity is when you have the ability to think for yourself and speak for yourself, or in some sort of way, right, eye movement or whatever. So it set the ground for the, for the legal community to define what is capacity and who gets to decide, all righty? So then there came Terry Scheibel in, um, in 1990. She too fell into a pers persistent vegetative state after a sudden cardiac arrest, which means your heart stopped beating. It stopped and they had to do CPR and they got her alive again, but the tube in her throat breathed, beating too to keep her alive. Alrighty. And the family in this case was a husband who wanted to remove, and he was within his legal right to do that. Because when you're married, if you haven't created an advanced directive, your husband or partner legally gets to decide what happens to you. They, he was at odds with his parents her parents. The parents said she would want to live. She would absolutely want to live. And he said, no, he wouldn't. No, she would not. But they're fighting because she did not fill out an advance directive and, ex and identify a decision maker. So you see where these cases are building and building and the importance of this for advanced care discussion is all now in legal documents. And that's what I'm gonna talk about today is how do you do that? And how do you have a conversation with the people that care about you? So that people aren't fighting, that there is an agreement, all righty? So that's what we're gonna talk about. <clears throat> We're not going to talk about um, today, other than very briefly in describing the difference is what happened with Brittany Maynard. Brittany Maynard, Maynard was in 2014 um, and she was the um, person who went to suit for a physician assisted right to die. She had a terminal illness. She knew what the end was going to be. She made the decision that she wanted to die, but she wanted to do it legally so that life insurance and all of that stuff would follow and that every she could talk about it beforehand with her loved ones. But she also needed help at that point because she did not have the necessary medication to take. So she wanted physician to help prescribe that. So that's what Brittany Maynard was all about. And those are all issues that 
are going to come to the surface as you start thinking about things. Alrighty. So the debate continues on this whole physician assisted suicide, which is legal in Oregon. I think there's five states, Oregon, and it's on the East Coast. I don't remember, but I know Oregon here. Alaska tried, Harriet Drummond tried bringing it forward, and it was passed in 2017 in the first round, and neither the House or the Senate. Then it went to the judiciary, and it died there. So Alaska does not have physician-assisted suicide, which means physician-assisted suicide or death means that if I want to die, I know this is the outcome. My physicians know this is the outcome. I passed all the psychological tests and I realize this is what I want. And I want to talk to my family about this, prescribe it. In physician assisted suicide, you must be able to take it yourself. Okay, you have to be able to swallow the medication unless you're skilled at doing intravenous to yourself, it's in pill form. So physician-assisted suicide can, is only legal here in the United States for somebody who does it themselves. There is passive and involuntary euthanasia, which means that you've made a decision that when I get to the unconscious state, I want you to inject something to end my life, all right? And that is called passive euthanasia, where somebody, a, a medical provider injects something to end your life because you are dying, but you got to the point where you are now are unconscious. And there is also involuntary euthanasia, which is practiced, but not legal, and that's where you are given an injection because you are dying and people want to give you relief, but you, they've never talked about it. It's just somebody who believes in compassionate response to somebody who is suffering. But that's not legal here in the United States. Yes? You spoke about passive and physician assisted. Are they allowed in Alaska? No. Okay. Just Oregon. No. So all this it's not is just... legal here in Alaska. <laughs> is, is passive legal? No. Okay. No. There is no um, physician assisted um, at this point that I'm aware of. But there is discussion at the legislative level. And so when you hear about it, whatever your opinions are about it, it, it is handled at the legislative level at this point. All right, so um, euthanasia, it, it all continues um, to be debated, heavily debated across the world. All righty, so what do we know about all of this end of life discussion and who wants to do it and who doesn't? Well, according to surveys by the National Health Institute, 90% of people say talking to their loved ones about end of life is really important. 90% of people think this is a good idea. How many have done it? 10%. One in four, about 25%, 27% of people. They know people are saying this is important. And that's why I'm here today. To help all of you make the decisions that are right for you and how to have those conversations. Alrighty. So 60%, they do not want family members burdened with making a decision when they're unsure. They don't want a family member to have to decide. 56% have not communicated those end of life wishes. 80% say if they were seriously ill, they'd wanna talk about end of life treatment. And if they had a serious 
like uh, Lou Gehrig's disease or um, Alzheimer's diagnosis, something like that. People say they'd want to be able to talk to their doctor. Well, even less have talked to their doctor about what is quality of life. 7% of people have talked to their providers. And finally, 82% say it's really, really important to put this in writing. Any guesses to how many people, what percentage has actually done it? Less than 25%? Yeah, <laughs> less than one out of four, 23% actually have put it in writing. What I can tell you, let me tell you a, a, a quick story. Um, about 25 years ago, um, my husband and I decided we had four children and we went, oh, we got to do a last will and testament. You know, we have to do this so that somebody, you know, with the guardian for the kids, it's really important and we need to do this. So we wrote, wrote our will, we wrote our, and then while we were there, the attorney said, oh, you got to write your advance directive. You may as well do that too. Oh, okay. Oh, well, what do we want? Oh, okay. Well, well, I wouldn't want that and I wouldn't want that. And yes, do that. So he wrote it up and we signed it and it was notarized. 25 years ago, unbeknownst to me that a mere three or four years later, I would have to use that advanced directive for my husband. He was killed in a national accident, resuscitated. Didn't make it officially to the hospital, um, but he was killed. My, I have four sons, we have four sons, and two of them were involved in that accident. They were 13 at the time. They were distraught that they just let him die. 13 year olds, didn't understand. He was a strong, vibrant man. He was our dad, but at 13, they, it was very difficult, especially with the trauma to explain all of that. But I could honestly say, you know what, daddy and I talked about this. He did not, want to be alive on a tube that made him breathe. He was so, um, this accident, he was so hurt, they would have had to put a feeding tube in and he didn't want that. In fact, he wrote it down with an attorney and we signed it and we both agreed to that. Now, it was comfort, not enough, but it was comforting to them to go, Oh, he he wouldn't have wanted that. No, I, I guess he probably wouldn't have. Well, then you kind of, you know, you made the right decision, Mom. So I'm saying this isn't just for people with gray hair to do this. We need our young people talking about this too. In fact, we need our young people who have life-limiting illnesses talking about this. Children with cystic fibrosis or cancer diagnoses need to be able to have these conversations. And there's ways to do that and there's tools to do that. So if you are involved, and I hope you're not, with a young person in your life who's diagnosed with a life-limiting illness, let them know or let their family, parents know that it's okay. And it gives a voice to a really important chapter in their story. Okay. So enough of that. Let's move on to four principles of ethics and what should be guiding us in our decision making. The first of the four is autonomy. Autonomy means you get to decide how to live your life. 
You get to decide what you want. You, as a human being on this earth, are recognized with the ability and the liberty to make your own decisions when you have capacity. All righty. Non-malfeasance is the ethical principle for physicians and medical providers that says, do no harm. A physician or medical provider who you are under their care has an ethical obligation to do no harm. That can play into advanced directives because a physician may determine, oh, the quality of life isn't, then the negative quality of life hasn't been met. Or I don't believe in that and I'm not going to do that. All righty. So it's important to understand that about your medical provider, where they personally stand. They also have the ethical obligation of doing good. So when we can be really clear about what we want, then they will follow through and do good. And the final, the final ethical principle in end of life care in, from healthcare is justice. That we have to be fair to everyone. And a physician is not going to pull the plug because he needs the ventilator for someone else. All righty. So all of these play into advanced care planning. And there's some end of life terms. Have you heard of hospice? What is hospice? End of life care. End of life care. So hospice is <laughs> legally defined as a life limiting illness of six months or less. All right. You can be reevaluated and re upped, and then they start a new six months. So somebody can be on hospice for a really long time, that they're living well, they recover a bit, but they still have a life limiting illness, but then the six months starts over again. So it could be longer than six months. Have you heard the term palliative care? Okay, palliative care is that there is a life limiting illness or a life altering illness like cancer. You may or may not be diagnosed with a cancer that will kill you, but a cancer that will need treatment. Palliative care includes hospice. Palliative care is a medical discipline that helps people and coordinates all the doctors and care that you need for, for a for a illness like that. Alrighty. Alrighty. So um, within end of life care, there's also additional terminology. Comfort care is one of the terms that gets thrown out there and then you and then it adds sometimes confusion to the conversation but comfort care is not causing death like a physician assisted suicide it's more not preventing <laughs> death comfort care would include something like a person on hospice. Um, and I know of another family right now who's in the middle of it, where the mother is very aged and due to strokes, very debilitated, not really aware of her surroundings, who she's with, conversations. She keeps getting bladder infections and they keep treating her with antibiotics. This woman's well over a hundred years old 
one person, the decision maker, wants to keep her alive at all cost. Everyone else sees that she's suffering because she's crying for her mommy at 102. She wants to go home, in my opinion, and that's her way of saying it now. So if you do not want that to happen in your life, it's really important to identify a good decision maker. Sorry. Who will offer or go along with comfort care. Yes. Chris, I thought that hospice, if you were on certain medical treatment and went on hospice, they were just going to keep you comfortable. <laughs> Had some of that medical treatment that went away. Am I wrong? I didn't. I'm sorry, with your mask, I'm having a hard time. Is there a limit to the medical treatment you can receive on? No. Not all. Oh. Right. They keep giving her antibiotics. Is that hospital therapy? Would that be included? Well, he's a decision maker and um, she wanted antibiotics. Or so it's said. But like if you had a patient that was receiving um, aggressive treatment for cancer, would that be the same thing? No, that's different. That's different. So, and can you be in hospice with that? Yes. And with having chemotherapy. Can you have chemotherapy and be in hospice? No. Okay. There is you in well. My understanding, and correct me, but they can give you chemotherapy to reduce pain. Okay. Right? Is that right? And so that would be the rationale for the antibiotics. It's not to cure the infection, but it's to decrease the discomfort from the infection. That's correct. Correct. That is the argument. Yes. But not everybody sees it that way. Jimmy Carter, 99, he left the hospital for hospice. Mm -hmm. And if I understood Jimmy Carter's family, it's, uh, I don't want any aggressive treatment. I want to just stay home with my family. And yes, and to keep peace. them comfortable. Yes. Yeah, okay. Yes, so, that is what's going on. He spent time in a hospital. He's been on place. hospice. Yeah. He's probably been reevaluated, and his six months is now tacked on to the original time. Okay, so he's just because okay. it can keep adding. Yeah, okay. It's not. It's six months assessment, and some people go completely off hospice. After six months, they get better, and the prayers work, and or whatever. Okay. Does that answer your question too? Well, they took my dad off treatment when he went on hospice. Yes. Okay. Yeah. That's, my, dad, that's where I got that. Once well, you they went on hospice, you insisted, lose treatment. Right. Yes. Pardon? They insisted that he go off treatment. Yeah. If he was going to be on treatment. Correct. Right. Yes. You off mm -hmm. intervention that is curative. Yeah. That's what you have to agree to as part of hospice. But that was chemotherapy may be used to reduce a tumor size because it's causing pain. So the difference between, just to clarify, between hospice and palliative care, in palliative care, you can receive some yes. curative treatment. Correct. Correct. It kind of looks like this. Palliative care and hospice at the end. So palliative care is like that. Palliative care includes hospice. It is part of the projector. But palliative care includes lots of treatments and, and curative efforts and those sorts of things. Once you get to hospice, you say no more curative. Okay. Um, yeah, that helped me understand the difference.
that palliative care is part for hospice is part of palliative care. And palliative care is not part of recovery. Of recovery? Yes. Or treatment. Yes. Right. But we're all dying. Right. It's just a comfort. Right. So this could be, I mean, could be way, 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 way up there. Right. <clears throat> but it is part of a continuum. That's all I'm saying. Way, 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 way bigger triangle. Alrighty, so compassionate extubation or withdrawal means that you are no longer, your brain is no longer functioning. You're considered brain dead. You might be breathing yet, you might be warm, but you have died. You are using tubes to keep you warm and breathing and feeding tubes. Compassionate extubation is removing that term and allowing a natural death. All righty. DNR, DNI, DNAR, do not resuscitate is on your chest, okay? What you see in the movies is not reality for CPR. They are pressing hard enough, likely breaking your ribs, okay? You do not wake up and start talking. You will have a long recovery, whether you're 20 or 90. You will have a long recovery to get over CPR and your heart stopping. You will not necessarily be the same person you were before and after CPR. All righty. So just to be aware of that, do you want them to do chest compressions on the 102-year-old who has a stroke? No, probably not. Do um, DNAR is do not attempt resuscitation. So that means the um, EMTs rush in and they start in CPR, okay? In nursing homes, care facilities, sometimes people get started because they get shook up. They react. <laughs> yes, they react. And so do not attempt either. I don't want resuscitation. Don't even start. Let me be really clear. Do not even start. Do not even attempt. D-N-A-R. And DNI is do not intubate, which is the breathing tube. All righty. So let's talk about the documents that you need to have. I have no idea what time it is. I'm just talking away. Ooh, gosh. Yeah, I'm going. If you just keep talking, if people need to leave. All right. Oh, okay. appreciate hearing what you have. Yeah. So this is my phone and contact information up here, but I'm, I'll pull that back down and I can make it bigger if you need it bigger. <laughs> but let's talk about documents you need before death and then after. Yeah. Okay, there are confusing terms that are used on both sides. And sometimes they're dug on the exact same thing. All right. A P O A. Power of attorney. Two types of power of attorney. One is for money, and one is decisions. Power of attorney are often called in this one, 
uh, healthcare decision maker. Um, what are some other terms I'm drawing a blank? Medical power of attorney. Medical power of attorney. Thank you. Can it also medical power of attorney? Can it also? But you also need a power of attorney for money because you have a heart attack. You you're resuscitated. Your electric bill is still due. Your mortgage payment needs to be made. You need to cash those Medicare checks or whatever it is that is related to money before you die, but you're incapacitated. You need to have a medical power of attorney. And you need to have a power of attorney or medical power of attorney for the person who is going to speak for you when you cannot speak. They do not have to be related to you. You can identify anybody who's at least 18 years old, of sound mind and body, is going to be able make the decisions that you want made. Not a, none of my four sons is my medical power of attorney. I am not going to have them be my medical power of attorney. They likely will be shocked by that, but I do not want them to be burdened with that with their history. I, they're just now doing well. I don't want to burden them with that. So my sister is my medical power of attorney. Now, one of my kids is my financial power of attorney because they live here, and that makes sense. He gets to make, he knows where my checkbook is. He can take it to the bank and get, he can handle my affairs. All righty. So the other thing you need is an advanced directive. also called a living will. An advanced directive names your power of attorney for health care. It also identifies what you want to have done. Do you want to be intubated? Do you want to have the feeding tube? Do you want CPR? What do you want done? These are legal documents, but can be, what is the word? Based on your medical provider, will they be able to follow through Contested. with what you want? Contested? Yeah. I'm just going to pass. Oh, this yes, yes, yes. It's yeah, really let's do, do the handouts. Some of that. And to Chris's point, it talks about just because it's there, will it be followed? And how important it is to have those conversations is really the main thing. It's important to get it in writing. But to have yes, it is a You In this word, it's called voluntary legal document, which means, look, back here. Voluntary legal document means somebody could ignore it. You don't want that. But the clearer you are, the medical team by law is supposed to follow it. And do you have to become the, you know, Terry Shivo family to get them to implement it? It's not been done yet that a medical provider hasn't followed, that I'm aware of, has been sued because they haven't followed an advanced directive that was clear or didn't follow the wishes. But my guess is it could be coming somewhere in the courts. We had a question in our first class, and I can't remember who asked it, about one of the forms did not have the name, their name right at the top. And so the provider would not accept it. 
Oh. Um, and I was looking at some of our forms and they don't actually say this is the advanced directive for us. Do you know, does that ring a bell? Have you had any experience with that? That, I was, not. That's okay. that was me. It was, and it was the when we went to update our will, and he said, "Do you have an advance directive?" I, oh yes, I have that. And then he looked at it. He said, "This is worthless because it doesn't state this is the advance directive of." Even though I signed it and had it notarized at the bottom. This it, it needs to declare according to him. And the provider so, wouldn't follow it. Well, it was the attorney well, who see. said this is not going to be valid in court. Wasn't a good form. Okay. Can I make another comment, please? Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, good. Um, it's just also really important to have it visible in the home. If family members aren't uh, around. Yes. And emergency people come, they don't know how to act, and it takes time to contact the hospital or to find the family. And so, like, stick it on the fridge. Yes. Which is a really beautiful bridge. It's all about the conversation with families. You can have a legal document, but you got to talk to your family. Well, and when you're in distress and EMTs come and there's no family around, they have, they have no idea. Yes, I'm sorry that happened yeah. to you. I'm sorry. Must have been very frustrating. Oh, I think it happened to Jan. So family will get involved at some point yeah. and it may delay, but a clear advance directive will most likely be honored because you can always threaten a lawsuit. Unfortunately, that's sometimes what happens. So, so you need an advanced directive or living will. I'm just gonna finish with the terms. Once you die, these are useless. They go away. What you then need is a last will and testament. And you need an executor. So the power of attorney is done when someone dies. Oh, yeah. yep. okay. These all go away. They're useless. Once you die, your last will and testament will handle your debts, and your assets and your burial. A last will and testament goes to all of that. That's all it does. An executor is the one who implements it. They're in charge of doing it. So that's a whole different set of documents. And those are usually prepared by an attorney, but don't have to be. They really don't have to be. They have to be notarized. A lot, pardon? Notarized, though. It actually doesn't even need to be notarized. Really? My understanding, my understanding is it doesn't even need to be notarized. That you can write it on the back of a napkin and somebody will have to honor it. Where did I put that? So in Alaska, Oh, here it is. In Alaska, if you die with no will and no executor identified, um, or if, ex excuse me, this is only for um, before death, before death. If you haven't identified anybody, you thoroughly designated to somebody so you're still cognizant and you say where's my friend Sally I want Sally here I want Sally to make to speak for me she knows me we've been neighbors for 10 years you can do that orally medical staff will have to abide by that in Alaska 
then it becomes a spouse, an adult child. And if you don't want your spouse making decisions for you, or you don't want your kids making decisions, then it becomes an adult sibling and a close friend as a final one, okay? So the majority rule, um, when there's disagreement, and in families, there's always disagreement. The one who insists on, mm -hmm. on continuing um, antibiotic use and those who don't want antibiotic use, it is the majority rules in Alaska of adult decision makers, which includes children, parents, and siblings in Alaska. So in that situation, if you had a spouse, would they trump all the majority decision makers it does not alaska. list spouse in alaska you know it is different in different states every state is different but that's if you have them identified uh yes if you've identified them it's this is when it's in absence yeah it does not list spouse you can oh no i trust you <laughs> i know and every state is different. And was it an oversight? I don't know. I don't know. So if you're, if you travel a lot and <clears throat> you have it all set up for Alaska and then you buy out of the state, that state's um, rules take over? Actually, <laughs> Yeah, if you carry, I usually carry my advance directive with me when I'm traveling. So, because now I have a disorder that um, can affect. So, I carry it. They are supposed to follow the state, my understanding, they're supposed to follow the state you live in, because okay. that's how you wrote it with that understanding of those laws. All righty, so advanced directives and power of attorney. You can get the, download these things off of um, internet. They're all over the place. Those you have to sign and notarize. These you do. <laughs> it's interesting, you don't need it for the will. Everybody does it and it makes it legal and binding. But, yeah, in the absence of a legal document, they will read the napkin. <laughs> um, it seems like every one of your medical providers asks if you have a, a living will, and they want copies of it. Yeah. Now, I have a problem with that, because what if you change it, and then you've got copies around? What's sure. your advice on that? I leave mine with my medical records at the hospitals because that's where most likely, because I'm basically healthy, I have no life-limiting illness. But if I'm in a car accident, I want the hospital, regional, they all accept an advance directive. And then when you change it, then you take it to the three places. Okay. And if you change providers, you give it to your new providers. But if you're like, go to Providence Health System, the, um, they're on 36 and Latouche, that's in the Providence system. Yeah. So then you wouldn't have to go to the hospital per se, because it's its own tab in the hospital. So um, I'm thinking along the lines of Mary Beth, you know, I change my mind all the time. So I have kept yeah. these um, living wills at home, thinking I have I live with a spouse, and I'm thinking if something happens, but so how does that hold things up to just present it on the spot? That how does that work? Yeah, that's a good question, Betty. What do you think would happen? Fine. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and what if he's in the car accident? Would somebody be able to find it? What if you're shopping at the mall and I have. I have one of my kids who knows where all of my documents is. Right. My right. best friend knows where they are. 
and now I'm recently remarried and now my spouse knows. It's in a red binder on the bookshelf underneath the buttons. That's kind of how mine is when people don't know. Yeah. 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 But all the important documents are there. But it would have but you can present it. Someone could present it at the last minute and it wouldn't and it would be it would depend on the date of the document. So if you have something like you take it to the hospital, if you have a more updated one, they follow the one based on the date. So last will and testament is not the same thing as a living will. You know, these terms get thrown around. Yeah. Power of attorney, medical power of attorney, medical power of, or power of attorney for financial. It's confusing, right? So power of attorney, you want to have somebody who's going to take care of your bills so you're not evicted, right? You want somebody identified who's going to make these decisions on your behalf when you cannot speak. And you want to have your decisions written down. So you provided five wishes. And let's see. I've, yeah. There's all kinds of them out there. Five wishes is the one that's often talked about. You get it for five bucks from the aging from Dignity. All righty. This document is really good if you want somebody to kind of hold your hand, you know, hold your hand and go, okay, what do you think about this? All righty. This document kind of helps you through that stuff. And it identifies right here up front, who's your decision maker. But then it asks five questions. So where are they? Who, who do I want decision to make the decisions? Power of attorney, decision maker. What kind of treatment do I want? Intubation feeding tube, CPR, those are the big ones, and antibiotics is the fourth of the big ones. How comfortable do I want to be? That means what, basically, what's your pain tolerance? Do you want to not feel any pain at all, that you don't want to go there and be completely out or do you want to be fully experienced this final chapter, these final pages, and experience whatever comes? Or are you somewhere in the middle? You get to decide and you write it down. Um, how do I want people to treat me? That's on your last. Um, days, do you want, don't play country western. <laughs> okay. Harp music drives me crazy. <laughs> All right. Don't let like jazz. Like <laughs> okay, whatever. How comfortable do you want to be? Do you want to be at home? Are you willing to be in a hospital? Identify that. Alrighty. And the final one is what do you want your loved ones to know? This is a 30,000 foot view. All right. It really doesn't go into many specifics, but it does kind of walk you through the process. It does help. But there are tons of them out there. Alaska Native Medical Center has advanced directives. This is what it looks like. It gives you tons of stuff in their little binder. Oh, the picture. It gives the advanced directive in much more of a legal kind of terminology. The VA has one. Mayo Clinic has one that I personally really like. They're all available free, or the vast majority of them, just for the asking. Um, the Mayo Clinic has them. Um, who else? Oh, Providence has one. Regional has one. 
ones we have, and there's one that the one that's recommended by the um, AARP is Caring Info. Um, okay. And we just we just have a few examples over there. You can look at them. If you like Chris's example of the five wishes, they actually they're fifteen dollars if you order them individually. But if you like that, let me know, and we'll put in a group order. And and yeah, fifteen dollars for one. Whoa. <laughs> So there's five bucks if you order like more than you know sure. we could order a group of them so there's tons of them out there and they're all the same thing including five wishes you know can i my husband and i did five wishes and the reason why it was really good for him yeah. is because he is just this is just like nowhere when it comes to medical right. this is and it's so easy for me to say explain it to him yeah really, it's really well. exactly somebody who's very reluctant to a conversation five wishes absolutely that's a great point it's just so clear for him yeah so um there are as well if you have children in your life thinking ahead these are all free and online. Thinking ahead, these are for young people who may have been di diagnosed with life-limiting illness. Voicing my choices. Now, this, these are not legal documents because minors can't sign, all righty? But they can tell us what their choices are. Pediatric starter kits. So there's also documents out there for people who are mentally or uh, otherwise abled, okay? So those perhaps with Down syndrome or something like that, you can get some of those documents already. So how do you begin this? Well, my best recommendation is to go to Caring Conversations. Caring Conversations. This is online. And this begins the journey of making some decisions and having conversations with the people that you love. Okay. All righty. It helps you identify what your concerns are. It helps you to consider. It has an inventory of like 25 questions. Oh, let's see the inventory. If I had a terminal illness, I would prefer one not to know how quickly it's progressing to five. Know my doctor's best estimation for how long I want to live. That's just one of the 25 questions. And this is available online from the Conversation Project. Ellen Goodman, the writer, started this and is working with the Institute for Healthcare Improvement. It also gives you great examples on how to have conversations with your loved ones. How do you begin? Including, so you've made all of your decisions and we've talked about, okay, it's 1046 for people who need to know. So um, how to break the ice with your family. For example, do you remember when Jim died? Was that a good death or was that a bad death? Would be a way to begin a conversation with a loved one. And that's a whole nother hour long discussion. How do we do that? How do we have conversations with loved ones and providers? We can make all of these decisions. We can do all of this stuff. But unless we're talking to our loved ones where there's consistency, it's going to be hard to implement or certainly be delayed. So it is not unusual. I have a two page document that I've written to my four sons. Very clear. If I'm burned 90% of my body, let me go. I, I don't think that's what it is, but all righty. But it's a very clear letter. This letter, and I'll give you one because I think it's really nice. It helps when you are no longer able to make the decision to have something in writing that is speaking your words. 
that isn't attorney speak or book speak or word speak, right? Attorneys want to do advanced directives. They do. But you don't need an attorney. You can use any one of these documents and have it notarized. But a personal letter will truly explain where you're coming from. And Chris, I love that it's in your writing. And in your own writing. So this is an example from a woman. Don't panic. It's okay. If you are faced with a decision that you're not ready for, it's okay. I'll try to let you know what I would want for various circumstances. But let me tell you, I worked in a hospital for 15 years. There's a gabillion set of circumstances. Gabillion. You cannot predict them all. But if you come to something we haven't talked about or decided, it's okay. And if you choose a decision point and, your res and that results in my death, it's okay. You don't need to worry that you caused my death because you haven't. I will die because of my illness or my body failing or whatever. You do not need to feel responsible. Forgiveness is not required. And if you feel bad, plant a tree or a flower and recognize my passing. And it goes on. All righty? You can do that as well and add it to your advanced directive. My letter is attached to the hospital advanced directive. I have tried having the conversations with my children, and they have a really, three of them have a really hard time with it. But one is okay to listen. The other is sort of okay. But the two who were involved with the accident don't want to have anything to do with the thought of me dying too. So. But you've got, it, you've got it written down, so yes, do. they can't argue about it later. That's right. That's it's very thing. clear. Yeah. So all four of them. Then as you're looking at these other last things to do, there's all kinds of books out there. This one was for the Foundation for End of Life Care, free out of Juno. And it goes into, well, it's not just your last will and testament. But well, what about all those passwords you've got? <laughs> and no one you can turn off your Facebook. One thing I have done. <laughs> so that's a whole nother discussion, another hour discussion. But there's all kinds of books out there um, that you can buy. Um, I'm Dead, Now What? That one's a good one. You can get on Amazon. And it just lists, okay, what are all your bank accounts? What are all your credit cards? What are the passwords to all of yeah. these things? What was the name of that you don't want to leave for the burglar who comes. Exactly. <laughs> what was the name of that one? I'm the, sorry? The one you just mentioned on Amazon? Yes. Um, it's called I'm Dead Now What? And that's kind of what we have in this for you. Just to And little, something like that. Yeah. Kind Final of affairs. So. You've got all of that kind of stuff. What? Where's my car title? Where's the, the logistical okay. stuff? Where's the extra house key hidden? <laughs> you know, I'm telling you, having lived an accidental death, I had no idea. None whatsoever. And it makes a hard job harder. Really, it does. So, especially for young people. So you need to talk to young people about this stuff too, because accidents, especially in Alaska, happen. There's another, this is just one, caring conversations for young adults. Mm -hmm. And I've actually had two different sets of young 20-ish adults come and say, do you just come and talk to us when we have wine and cheese some night? You know, we, because one of their friends was killed in a car accident yeah. or yeah. fell off a paragliding. Yeah. Well, it happens. So it's, it, yeah, it's in, it's out there, and then there, there's resources to right. make it easier. And anybody who has minor children really needs to have a last will and testament because they become. I mean, 
I have two granddaughters now, the true joy of my heart. Um, and I looked at them and said, so you guys are going to get your will done? And they went, and I went, do you realize that if you're in a car accident, the state becomes their guardian? You realize that, right? Silence. And they got it done. And the state would probably turn them over to me, you know, not foster care, likely. But the state gets to decide. Do you really want that? So it might be another way of introducing this stuff to young people, especially with minors. Anyway, I've talked over the, the time that I was gifted to be with you today. What other questions do you have? I've dumped a lot of info. Thank you so much. You are welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Next Sunday, we'll take an opportunity if you want to come back and we can just kind of brainstorm some of those questions. We also have a speaker next week that's going to come and talk to us about alternate burial arrangements in Alaska. Green funerals, if you will. It's kind of a new topic that's out there. Um, I've heard her a couple times. I think it'll be really interesting to stimulate some discussion, if nothing else. And I think Chris has worked with this group. Yeah, I'm on. I'm on a committee with them. It sounds right. It sounds a little woo woo to me. I am a traditionalist, but I think it'll be really good for us to think about. Okay. And they know the important thing is they know in Alaska what you can do because right. it's very. It's true. just it's thinking outside the box. So that's next week. We're pun intended. <laughs> if you have questions or would like me to work with you one on one with some specific stuff, feel free to call, text, or email. Okay. I had a little business, but that's good. She's in Girdwood. What's what is the name of the gal in Girdwood's company that do you remember? Sorry. We're <laughs> I'll get it for you. Okay, thanks for that. No, well, I think it's so it's for a Chris Green dot 907 at Gmail or 907-748-4885. Chris, just really quickly, can you address, and there's no wrong answer, Pulsed? Oh, a Pulsed. So a Pulsed is sort of like this, all right? Advanced directive and a pulse is a uh, position order for no L S T position order for life sustaining treatment. Do you have an advanced directive that anybody can write at any time? A pulse is when you get towards the end of life and you need to have a document that's clearer and written by a physician. And especially if you are living in a home with hospice, you have a pulse so that when the family member gets shook up and EMT arrives, they are not to attempt resuscitation if that's what you have put in the pulse. The doctor's order. It's a doctor's and that order. Frequently is placed on the refrigerator. So when the EMTs come to your home, they know that's the first place they look for that money. Correct. So it is a legal document that will stop somebody who's in the medical field, who will, by ethics, start life support. If there's if no one- you under rushed in and you saw the 102-year-old, you'd start compressions if you didn't know anything different because that's your that's ethical yeah. obligation. That's Thank why you. I spent time Thank talking you. about all of that stuff. How do you spell that? Oh, um, just really just to time. add, I'm sorry, just to add to that, because we you know, looked into that because there was no pulse in our recent um, circumstances. And it is like an orange envelope. It's really bright, so it can be seen. But the director at the place where um, my mother-in-law lived also found out that just in the last year, something called Comfort One, which we have not yet explored, 
is in a lot of other states and it was just instituted in Alaska too. So it's another form of being able to is, let people know wishes. That is absolutely correct. Pulse has now replaced comfort one, but terms are being still used interchangeably. I'm glad you said that because that was my impression that yes, comfort one is it no has longer. replaced comfort one because oh. of the ambiguity. Spell was oh. missed. There's a paper there. Becky, you know, did you get one? Okay. I guess I did. Well, I just came yeah, it was the last one. So Tara has my contact information if any of you have further questions or parish nurses also have been trained in this several times and you could certainly ask, answer any of those questions as well. Thank you so much, Chris. Thank you very much. Thanks. Have a good week, everybody. Thank you.